never used StreamYard before. I never and, have either. And we're live. Awesome. So, episode one, Lizard Brain Radio. And as everybody saw in the Facebook posts, um, I'm cheating and I'm using my friends to start out. So it's I'm interviewing people I know. So it's less awkward for me. Uh, Bill Stewart, what's up, dude? Hey, I'm good, man. How are you, Bill? I am uh, nervously doing an interview on a podcast with my friend. So I'm we'll nervously that, being we'll interviewed. See, we'll I see how that goes. I know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> no, so we just interviewed you on Reptile Room Confessions, where yeah. we were very specifically talking about your background in therapy and the your uses for reptiles and all the programs you're doing, which are awesome. And at the Thank end, you. at the end, I want you to let people know where they can find you and and all that good stuff. Um, yeah, for sure. But I. As I was talking to Teresa and talking to Ryan and them a little bit, uh, I noticed that we never really talked about all of the lizards that you work with. Like, and you you are such a big gecko dude, and you work with so many species. And then our whole episode at that time was about your work, kind of outside of your lizard breeding. Uh, so I definitely wanted to talk to you about that. And then when I was talking about doing Lizard Brain Radio, I was like, all right, well, you have to be the first person because. You're working with Cardidactylus, which I'm super yeah. jealous of. And then I get They're your baby in the auction. Cool. Yes. And then we start talking about a pleuris. And now we're talking about potentially getting more projects with that. Um, yeah, that's so going to be awesome. It, it, it kind of had to be you. Um, Thank so you. I'm excited. Yeah, man. <laughs> so I we were talking before everything went live. And I literally said I wrote down gecko, skinks, and other. <laughs> um, because you you work with tons of geckos. Um, I've always noticed you posting pink tongue skinks and, and yeah. all kinds of different stuff. Plus you have all the collection for Madison and rescue and all those different things. Um, so just kind of dig us in, man, start us with geckos. Like what, where are you looking at gecko projects? What are you focusing on? My collection what? has over the last maybe five years have ebbed and flowed. So I'll get new animals in and then I have a lot and then I'm like, Oh, I need to downsize a little bit and focus on some things. And then, I'll like downsize a little bit and then I'll go back and I kind of am always ebbing and flowing. And Ryan McVeigh always tries to be like my Yoda, like you need to focus and <laughs> you need to get organized. And I'm like, yeah, but I want to do these cool things also. Um, yeah, that's ridiculous. So, he says the same thing to me and then I end up with more projects and they're from him. That's nonsense. Th right. Exactly. Yeah. So he'll say things like you need to focus and, you know, really work with what you want to work with. And then he tags me in every post like, hey, look at all this cool stuff. Like, <laughs> stop right. doing that to me. <laughs> you need to focus. It's like, I'm sorry. Did you yeah. just buy a bunch of California stuff for your Indo right. collection? Like, yeah. oh, okay. You need to stop drinking so much. And here's a six pack for you. Like, yeah, what are exactly. You doing? I stop think that's it. called being an enabler. I'm I pretty think sure that's, that's being an that enabler. Is. I think yeah. he's the worst of them all. Right. Um, so right now I'm, I don't have a focus, Bill. <laughs> I like, I, geckos are just awesome animals. We, we love these animals. And so like I have leopard geckos and I have crested geckos and I have Chihua and I have uh, Saracenorum and I have a lot of the new Caledonian geckos. And I was keeping Bavea for a little while, which is one of the genus of new Caledonia that don't really get representation a lot in the hobby. Not a lot of people are familiar with them. I think there's like 20 different species of Bavea. Um, I was keeping uh, Robusta, which is one of the species of Bavea, but they're just a tiny little, they look like the the child of a morning gecko and a crusty like merged <laughs> together. Um, but, you know, and again, kind of focusing on some of those other species, like Curdodactylus is a genus that I've always been fascinated in. Um, right now I, I have the Pachellus that I'm working with. I have a male, I had a female Eloc who crashed. So I just have the male. Um, but there are several other species within that genus. I'm a huge fan of Paroidura. And so, you know, when we talk about Madagascar, I actually did a, a, a conversation with the Madison Herb Society last year about this. Cause when yes. people talk about Madagascar, we're always talking about the Felsuma and the day geckos. And then the, the leaf tail geckos get a lot of popularity, but the Paroidura genus is awesome and it's really diverse. And, you know, one half of Madagascar is a little bit more drier and arid and there are Periodura geckos there. And then in the middle of it, it's a little more mountainous. And then there's, it's tropical on the other side and the genus is dispersed. And it's, there's so many different geckos from that same genus that are so different. So I keep Periodura gracilis and I keep them cool and arboreal and humid. And then I keep 
you know, Picta or Stumpfy that are drier <laughs> and it's the same gecko genus. And that just blows me away that you could have these different animals that have different care, but they're in the same genus of gecko. Um, I have, and I, I always have a lot of oddball, like I work with Heteronosha benoei, and I kind of started in the last couple of years really looking at some of the smaller, like we call them micro geckos, and they're not all mm -hmm. micro geckos, but keeping like the little viper geckos or little um, pachydactylus is another genus. So like they're called tiger geckos, but pachydactylus tigrinus or um, fasciata, those are, you know, like some of those little tinier species. There's another um, Madagascar gecko, Ebonavia uh, inunguis, the little Madagascar clawless gecko. And we're talking adults are like, you know, two, three inches long and their eggs are like smaller than Tic Tacs. Um, and so I kind of don't have a focus. And then I've also been working with skinks. So I've had blue tongues. You, blue tongues are really popular pets and they're fascinating lizards. Um, I don't know if you guys have, do you have, you have blue tongues at the shop, don't you? I do. Uh, we just ended up with an Eastern that came in a group uh, to the yep. rescue. They are, um, they have the genetic flaw where they have swimmer shoulders. So their, their front feet are a little jacked up. Um, but stuff like that for us, I mean, they're perfect ambassador animals, right? So, you know, we can show, we have your plain old Indo Hufflepuff. That was the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Years long ambassador animal for friends of kale. So Hufflepuff lives at my shop. And then just to show the comparison, you know, like Easterns and a lot of blue tongues in general have become really expensive lately yeah. as they become more popular. And so when those Easterns came in, they came in from a breeder and um, rather than cull them, the breeder decides to place ones that have abnormalities and things with the rescue or with people. Yeah. They trust it's going to be a pet situation and it's not someone who would be, you know, dishonest about continuing the breeding and which is awesome. And so right. we're, we're on the board. We we're all for it. And uh, Erica and the folks at Friends of Scales call us, Hey, do you want to check this out? It'll give you a different blue tongue to show to people. Yeah, you know, for sure. And so I, I picked up the box from the house and I brought it home. And he had, the the breeder had written on there, you know, Eastern blue tongues. And then all of his boxes were already labeled like he was going to a show. And so he just boxed them up to give them to Ryan and Erica so that they could be brought back to the rescue and, and homed. But they had been priced and stuff. And so I brought it back and Teresa saw the box and was like, uh, excuse me, where, <laughs> you know, and I was like, no, no, you don't understand. This Let me explain. A, yeah. <laughs> this was just a sales box. Uh, he, this particular lizard has some issues. Uh, he needs some special care. So he's going to hang out with us and it's, he's totally fine. I just fed him yeah. a bunch of earthworms today and the, I have, I have one of those as well. <laughs> yeah. And I it, have one of they, those all just, they all just yeah. kind of scattered to our friends, you know? Yeah. Um, and it, it kind of has to be that way because it has to be a trustworthy thing, you know, because right. we knew we knew it came in with congenital issue. And so it had to be people, you know, that we knew wouldn't progress that. And um, Right. And I would worry about someone trying to breed that because, you know, right. I mean, we all get excited and want to breed things, but there are some animals and, we shouldn't. And well, and the issue with those is they look okay. Right. Y you know, until he, you know, Mine kind of walks a little funny, but it isn't anything where you'd look at it and go, oh, no, definitely don't produce that. And then Except you pick I them know, up and they go like this. <laughs> right. Yeah. Until you know the background. <laughs> right. And then, you, you know, you get the obviously you wouldn't do that. Right. Um, and then we also have a Helmahera that came through the rescue um, just to show because that's a pretty significant color difference. So a lot of people talk to us when they we go through like good pet versus bad pet. And we always do blue tongues as awesome pets. And then we get the 50 questions of, well, none of the ones I've seen look like the one that you have. And it's like, yeah, I know I have the cheap one. Like, you know, <laughs> I'll show you a more expensive one or, or whatever. Um, so those are the only three that we have. But I mean, they're far and away, aside from Tegu's, the number one lizard we use to show to kids. Yeah. Because, because they're kind of fat. You can... This sounds bad, but you can kind of beat on them when you're little kids, like little kids pet too hard and they yeah. kind of, they squeeze a little too hard. They're um, not very fragile. They're pretty, dude, they're yeah, pretty blue robust. Tongues, blue tongues yeah. don't care at all. No, they're, um, yeah. And they eat earthworms. Like it's perfect. Yeah. 
I like so, it. That's actually something that's appealing to me also is in, in moving into working with skinks. And I still keep a lot of geckos, but I do work with skinks as well. And their omnivorous diet is appealing to me, you know, and, you know, absolutely. tegus are fun to work with because tegus will eat, you know, mice and rats and chicken and turkey, but then they'll also eat vegetables and fruits. And having that, having an animal that has that varied diet is, it's fun. It's fun to keep up with it and whatever. And, and having a, a, a blue tongue that's omnivorous, you know, it kind of keeps the diet exciting. And, you know, beardies are omnivorous as well, but blue tongues, it's a little different. Feeding them is a little different. Well, um, and I think it's the care too. Like, it, I know it's a controversial topic, but beardies are a desert lizard. You keep them really hot and fairly dry, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, it's just easier for most folks to keep things like a blue tongue or even a tegu. And the benefit to the blue tongue is then you don't have to deal with tegu size. So, I mean, right. you know, our, ours, dude, ours are going well about to go down. It's been still a little bit warm here, even though it's getting later in the year. Um, but dude, they chill all winter and care less, you know, right. uh, keep up with the water, you know, make sure they don't lose any water weight, keep the humidity where it's supposed to be. Um, but they really don't care about eating for a significant portion of the year because we live in the Midwest. Like that's yeah. awesome. You know, beard is a roommate a little bit, but not nearly to that extent. Right. No. And yeah, my tegu's down for the count right now. She hasn't yeah. eaten in a little while. For my, sure. I have a group of Maruke blue tongues mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily shut down for winter, but they do slow down. And I can tell when I, you know, put their food bowl in and then the next morning I'm like, you guys didn't eat anything. And then that happens for two or three weeks. And I'm like, right. maybe I'll try feeding you every other week instead. And then I realize oh, I just need to like wait a little while yep. when I start seeing their heads poking out again. Um, yeah, you did mention pink tongues. I do have pink tongues. I have a small group of like the arboreal tree skinks. So I have, they're all in like my Zilla Bowfront display cages, just to drop that out there too. Nice um, but plug. I have like nice the, well you like that? I <laughs> snuck that in all nicely, very, yep. very gracefully. Yeah. The, um, the emerald tree skinks, the olive tree skinks, and the black tree skinks. And those, those, those animals are hilarious. They're so much fun to work with because they're so like, they're skittish, but they're curious at the same time. So I'll open the door to feed them and they're all like waiting to see like, what are you going to do? What are you going to give me? What's going on? Yep. And they're kind of jumpy, but then they kind of come back like, what are you doing? And so I don't try to hold them, but they're like interested in what I'm doing. And I, I love animals that are, they're arboreal and fossorial. So I have deeper substrates because they'll burrow and yep. they'll climb. And it's so weird to have an animal that does both. You know, we're so used to one or the other <laughs> these animals burrow in the substrate and that's how they live these animals live in trees well these skinks do both <laughs> and so they're burrowed and they're digging and swimming in the substrate and then they'll pop out and they'll climb tree branches and it's it's so neat to have the animal that utilizes like the entirety of its cage all of the time um and they're so much so, fun so when i did my olives i ended up with so i i really lucked out and i had to shop for them but my cork tubes come down and they look like the foot of a tree, you know, they flare oh, at cool. the base like that. Dude, I buried that flared out base. And then as the cork tube was going up, I just stuck a bunch of fake ferns in it. Um, and dude, it's the same way. Like depending on what's going on, you'll see little green faces popping out of the dirt underneath that base. Or yeah. you'll see green faces up in the ferns. My only thing about that, and I really have it with my crested geckos, is they want to know what you're doing but they also figure out where the food comes from. Yeah. So like the, my skinks, not so much. They don't jump as much. They, they skitter, but dude, my cresteds will straight up jump at me because they can see, <laughs> I, I use mealworm cups and I mix up my food in there and I was doing the same thing they for the, the, the skinks. Coming. Yeah. <laughs> as the cup is coming, they're not waiting for it. They're coming <laughs> to me. Um, and the skinks were doing it a little bit Weird. too. Like I would, at, I started putting the cup in the fake fern because if I put it on the ground, the ones in the fern would dive bomb me and oh I couldn't gosh. help myself from, I just had that, uh, I would pull back a little bit and I was so, I always thought I was going to let them out because they are pretty little. Um, yeah. And then dude, in my shop, they'd be a ghost. I'd never see him again. Yeah. Um, so I ended up sticking that cup in the fern and I would tilt it sideways so that that little bit of food would kind of run out on the fern and they would all just converge. So I don't have to worry about them jumping on me. That's so cool. Yeah, they're so much fun. And, you know, we always talk about, you know, you uh, people need to research what they're getting into. And they need to research their animal before they buy them. And we always talk a lot of that. And it's true. Like, we need to do that. But there's so much learning that happens when you have that animal. So 
you know, we can we can find a care sheet or we could do research on, okay, olive tree skinks, this is where they're from, this is the climate, this is the habitat. And we want to research it beforehand so we know what we're getting into. But then there's so much learning that we have just from the animal and experiencing the animal too. So it's like, we don't stop learning once we get the animal. Okay, I got the cage set up and it's, I don't have to worry about it anymore. It's all good to go. And just observing their behaviors and their interactions. And skinks are a lot more social than, you know, some geckos are, but skinks are a lot more social. Like I have the um, Agurnia stokasi, the uh, crevice tree skinks they're called. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're a, they're a species that are live bearers. So it's, they don't lay eggs. They, they give live birth like, like our blue tongues and our pink tongues would. Um, but they almost live communally where I, I have two babies now which is also kind of a funny story I'll get to about those skinks particularly, but I ended up with two babies and I just leave the babies. They, the, the adults raise them. And I think it yeah. actually can be detrimental to pull the babies away too early because I've actually like, you know, and Sarah and I were talking about it where we fed them and you could watch like the babies looking at the adult, like, and I, you know, the grown up is hunting the cricket and then the babies are watching them and then they're hunting the crickets. Like it's, crazy to see lizards like learning and observing their you know and having lizards parent their their young or whatever it's so cool well and i think part of in her pediculture i think maybe the reason that people might struggle with that is like dude we all grew up watching national geographic david attenborough and all these things right and a ton of that of course focused on snakes and yeah. to see parental care in snakes was always so rare Right. You know, and they'd be like, oh, the rattlesnake daycares and stuff like all the videos focused on that because normally, hey, they laid eggs or they had to lie. And they hit and the road. Things, yeah, they're gone. And they're that all was the by themselves in the wild venturing right. on their own. <laughs> yeah, and that was always the next part of the video. You know, you'd see all like, oh, this cobra defended its nest. And then all these other cobras popped out, which looked like little babies, mimics of the adults. Yeah. And they go off into the world and they're good. But like people never really saw that nowadays you do a little bit with the newer videos like a lot of the stuff david attenborough and them are doing now are far and away better content with all the 4k video and the cool stuff yeah. but when you're seeing something like the agernia you know i think part of the reason you probably didn't see it as much in the old school days for people making discovery videos and things like that was you really would just leave your camera on this little bush tree next to a big rock in the desert somewhere and just watch what they do all day long, kind of like meerkats. And yeah. it wasn't cuddly and cute like a meerkat. It looked like a little rock skink, and that's kind of boring. But that's that's how you start to realize that the care is so much different. Right. Like, you, you can't just take 20 baby corn snakes, separate them out into a hatchling rack. They all know how to eat pinkies. And they grow up to be big adult corn snakes. Good to go. These skinks and especially the tree skinks that we're talking about and, and a lot of other lizards that happen to live in those arboreal, but maybe semi-arboreal. It's more like a fat bush, you know, or rock piles <laughs> and things like that. Yeah. That's how they, that's how they live and that's how they develop and learn. And I think a lot of people probably struggle with that because you don't just go to the pet store or go to the trade show and buy one agernia, take it home. And then it just eats crickets and Pangea food. All by itself, you know, yeah, yeah. Right. It might if you drop the coin and, and buy an adult. Um, but if you breed them and produce them or you have groups of babies, and then we're talking about groups of babies. We're not talking mm -hmm. about single babies. And, mm -hmm. you know, that your time and your monetary investment to learn that is much more significant. It is. It is. And you don't think about that commitment when you're, you know, impulsively shopping at a reptile show either. Right. But I think, and then that, probably puts people behind the curve like you know oh some of these lizards are super hard to take care of or i struggled to get it eating and this that and the other and it's like well yeah because it didn't go in a hatchling rack and eat pinkies and just grow up you know it it didn't know what a pinky was until it saw this other thing eat it that looks like it yeah oh, that's what that's what i do oh that's cool. what i'm this is food <laughs> got it yeah yeah um we literally i i just hatched out button quail today um oh right on that's and, awesome yeah, it's pretty wicked. That's really we cool. Are, um, that was actually another, at the same time I was doing the auction for Madison Herp, where I got the gecko from you, I was participating in a charity auction for a guy. Uh, it was Mark and Maple. Maple is his service dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. So I ended up winning the button quail eggs out of that auction. Oh, um, awesome. 
so you when you put the water bowl in their enclosure um you put marbles or like little uh, aquarium stones in there because they're sparkly and the babies naturally walk around and peck things and as they peck at those sparkly things they figure out where the water is oh that's really cool otherwise there's a ch literally a chance they'll die with because, because they, they just don't can't drink. find water right because they're i don't have adult quail i i got these eggs in the mail and then incubated them like wow. i don't i don't have two parent birds walking around drinking and eating quail food to show them and i of course googled that to know that i don't raise quail so that i figured that out <laughs> um but, but it, still it that's stuff we don't think about right and i i definitely think that when i originally was talking to you about wanting to do you know this lizard based podcast because so many are snake based um i think that maybe part of the reason that it always seems like there's such a hard disconnect is it really is that different mm -hmm. like that's it that's an alien concept you know if if people had been in the hobby as long as you and i have but they were always snake dudes always into pythons always into boas or what have you and then you and i show up and it's like, oh, hey, we hooked up on this import. We got olive tree skinks. Check this out. They're like yeah. the emerald ones, but they're not. Right. And nobody else keeps them. And we're going to figure it out. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, dude, I, I don't do that. <laughs> like, you know, because they're like the you, you have the Terry Burwell method for pythons, right? You can keep every python in the world at 84 degrees. You can feed it every four <laughs> weeks and they they might not breed for you but they will all survive. They won't die. Right. Right. Water bowl, food source, once a month, 84 degrees, rock out for every Python species in the world. Right. And then the Barkers proved it by breeding all of them. Okay. <laughs> right. But, but then aside from a guy like, you know, probably Joe Hupp, where you're talking about the, the diversity of gecko species, um, we as lizard people don't have like, I'm not really sure who the barkers would be for lizards other than Joe. Because, yeah, there's because a few it, guys. It doesn't I know work like that, that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, and the, we're probably thinking of the same groups of people, but like most of those people would be nephrous dorks, right? Because they're all yeah. Australian lizards. We keep them all the same way. You, you know what I mean? You, yeah. you just talked about one genus from one island in on Madagascar, right? Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a, a Madagascar gecko nerd. Okay, well, yeah, you can't just build a room for that because your no. room would mirror Madagascar, which goes from dry forests to jungles. Like that's yes, you, it's so diverse and so it different is. that I think that really probably throws a lot of people. And I I like the challenge of it, and I like the learning. I like the individuality of the animals. Like yeah, like. You can't just have a commonality for keeping some of these animals. Like you could be, you could keep desert species and be like, I'm going to keep desert species. So then you have a room and it's the same temperature and it's all the same substrates. But even within that you have, you know, leopard geckos don't necessarily live in the desert and they need little humid microhabitats where another species, like Benoei don't need that humid microhabitat. Like they're fine being out and dry. So there's so much of a variability to it and it's learning that specific animal and it's not generalizable. I mean, I think in some cases it is, but I think you know, we're, with, we're working with lizards, you're working with that species. And there are some genus like Europlatus. I think you keep most Europlatus the same. Or um, sure, yes. like you said, Nephiris. If you work with Nephiris and not tails, they're all gonna have the same care. But then there are there are geckos like the, the, Paro, the, the Paroedura genus where you know, the gracilis are kept like Europlatus. They're kept cool and humid and wetter. And then you have the stumpy that are kept a little bit drier. And you you have to know the specific animal. You can't just have a catch-all for it. Right. Which I, I, That's always been appealing to me. And, you know, we talked about it before. And I think that's part of the, the gratification. And, you know, I like going towards those species that maybe no one else recognizes or no one else knows. And I, I can't describe exactly why it's appealing to me, but it's, you know, it's the, the needle in the haystack where you see all these things that look similar. And then there's that one thing that looks different and that's what catches my attention always. And also right. like some of those, you know, Ryan and I talk about it all the time, Ryan McVeigh for you listeners. And I, um, 
like gravitating towards those species that no one else works with because they're just ten dollar wild caught. No one wants to put the time and energy into breeding them because they're just fifteen dollar wild caught animals, and I'm I'm not going to get my investment back if I. You know, right. like we keep going back to the long tail grass lizards. Those things are awesome. They're yes. super cool. They're so much fun to watch and they have amazing personalities and they're really quirky, but no one wants to put a lot of time and investment into captive breeding them because they're six bucks at Petco. So, but they're awesome animals. Well, and I think too, that I think the reason that the lizards that you're describing are kind of gaining in popularity now is kind of. I don't even know how to say that. Like the dart frog syndrome. Okay. Um, dart frogs have been popular for a really long time, but they've been popular in a very select group of people Yeah, because they take an inordinate amount of work mm -hmm. and this setup. And nowadays that's not necessarily true because our equipment and our setups have advanced so far that a lot of it's automated and we can do a lot of different things. We, we can replicate their environments so well so on and so forth. There's a significant monetary cost for most of that, right? So you're, you're going to limit some people there. Um, but then I think most of the lizards that we have been talking about kind of need that. Like they need to have their habitat set up in such a way that you are going to observe those things. Like long tail grass lizards are cool when you see how they interact in a large grass enclosure and how yeah. the camouflage works and how they're able to climb, you know, how they actually use that tail and all that stuff starts to come into play. That's really awesome. But that's really awesome for you to observe. Right. You don't, you don't, you don't participate beyond building that enclosure. Right. And I think, I think it's, I think we're kind of in the sweet spot now where enclosures and equipment are catching up. To where now that would be easier for the average person to do after they got really way down the rabbit hole and the nerd research and we're talking to people like us. It's like, no, you don't <laughs> understand you don't understand how cool this really cheap lizard could be. Yeah. All you need to do is build a grassland. And they're like, Okay, well, I don't know how to build a what are you talking about? Build a grassland. Like that sounds really difficult. And well, let me nowadays, <laughs> yeah, but now the industry is such that we can show it. Them. Is. Yeah. You, you know, hey, check out these plants, these fake plants, real plants, whatever, bioactive or not. Here's lights and so on and so forth. Here's the enclosure and all these different things. Okay. Now the lizards are only 18 bucks for a trio, even though we spent a ton of money on the enclosure. Okay. <laughs> you know? there's a, yeah. And, there's a lot more things that are accessible now that maybe weren't 10 or 15 years ago. And I, I, I like that right. you brought up bioactive because I've always like enjoyed keeping bioactive setups. Like even before it was cool, like I, I go out and I, I you know, I, I would use topsoil as a substrate because I didn't quite know better, but I would have a drainage layer and I would, this is before anyone even knew of, you know, whatever. And um, I'd go out in my backyard. Okay. Here's some roly poly bugs. I just throw them in there and <laughs> I, I heard they eat shit. So stuff. Right. I don't know if I could say the S word on your podcast. Um, but like, you're right. Like a lot of the, and building the Viv is part of the fun. Like, you know, the journey is part of the fun when you go on vacation. Oh, the drive there is part of your enjoyment. But, and it's true. Like building the Viv is part of the fun and doing the backgrounds and decorating them. And that's part of the whole enjoyment of these animals. I love keeping these animals, but I love doing the environments and doing the, the setups. And that's part of the gratification. But you're right. Like things that were difficult 10 years ago or maybe seemed out of reach or challenging, I think are so much more accessible because the right. technology is there and the supplies are there and you can go on YouTube, how to make a Viv and there's 8,000 yes. videos <laughs> and everyone does a pretty good job of it. Like we all have the same common knowledge of how to do it the right way. And so I, and, but that's, and that's great. I really, I like that the hobby is doing that. Well, you also have to think that nowadays I think, I think people value that knowledge more. So, you know, when you're talking about doing something bioactive or, or you want to build an enclosure for an animal, even if you use silk plants and the whole thing's fake, who cares? Um, you needed to know ahead of time, like all oh, long tail grass lizards, they're kind of cheap. I want to build something. I heard they had cool uh, habits and all these different actions that they do. And I want to see that. Okay. Well, you had to do the research on, this cheap normal lizard to know 
that building this enclosure a special way would give you the satisfaction of seeing the special thing. Yeah. And so I, I just think it, it deepens people's knowledge base. You, you know what I mean? Like, so we, we were talking about leopard geckos, right? Everybody in the world has kept a leopard gecko. No big deal. Except what about human hides for leopard geckos? What about people that are talking about the different ways that maybe they absorb UV or they don't. Right. Or you, I know for a fact that you can keep them in racks and breed them by the thousands because people do commercially. Okay. Well, it turns out that in that genus, there's a bunch of other species that we don't normally keep. And now right. people are starting to. Now and there are, are weird, to. there are weird locality differences and they look a little different and sizes and all these different things. And it's like, okay, well, it turns out that if you did a little bit of research onto where they live, how it looks and these weird environmental quirks that maybe they have more quirks and specialties than we realized over these last 20 years of breeding them. And if we provide them with the special environment, we'll get to experience the special things. Yeah. And so absolutely. I think, I think people are just kind of connecting with it more. And I, I honestly think that's why the debate when people are like, Oh, tubs versus enclosures. Like, I think that's why the people fight so hard maybe is that the economy of racks and things, it works. I mm -hmm. have BOA master stacks and BOA file stacks and they're modular. They're easy to clean. I put cypress mulch in there in a water bowl and a hide. I'm good to go. I, I know that it works, right? Mm -hmm. I also know that I have built out, planted, cool enclosures and those snakes and lizards and frogs do more stuff than yeah. the snakes and lizards and frogs that are in the tubs. And I can see it. Mm -hmm. If if you haven't experienced one or the other, you don't understand the value. And I think maybe that's why people fight so hard. And especially when you're, I think that's a huge difference between snake and lizard nerds when you have people that are so separated. Like you and I keep a mixture and we've experienced both and tortoises yeah. and all sorts of things in the reptile world. Um, but if you were just a Python guy from day one and you figured out racks and it made your life easier, rock on. Mm -hmm. And then you had some enclosures and you got a, some different behaviors. That's fun. Cool. And then you talk to somebody who's into, you know, tree skinks or small lizards and they're like, oh no, you, you cannot have a sterile enclosure. You've got to have a decked out enclosure. Yeah. And the person you're talking to just doesn't understand what you're saying. They're like, no, man, I, I keep the stuff. It's all good. Oh, there paper are no towel. Negative, <laughs> yeah. There's no negative <laughs> side effects. Yeah. And the person, and then the tree skink person is like, what are you talking about? There's, <laughs> you know, and they just, they lose their minds because they're, they're literally talking about two entirely different. It's things. completely different worlds. I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I and think, it, I mean, we could, I don't know if you want to go down that rabbit hole, but like, you can keep animals healthy in tubs. That's fine. I think if they're meeting, if you're meeting their temperature, humidity and diet requirements, that's fine. But there are behaviors that are implicit in the animal, depending on the environment that they live in. So if you keep an animal in a rack, you're not going to be able to see it because it's in the rack, but then they might not even be demonstrating their social behaviors or, or whatever. You're missing out on this whole in my mind, you're missing out on this whole gratification of having these animals, of just being able to kick back and just watch them be goofy on their branches together. And, you know, yes. like those long-tailed grass lizards, I didn't realize until I had them set up and I did this. And they like a lot of branches and they like a lot of plants and they like it thick because they like hides, but the hides need to kind of be off the ground. So if you have enough foliage, then they can find their own little hide. But they'll like, they won't even use their arms and their legs. They'll just like glide down tree branches like a like they're like running on their bellies like a snake and it's like i never saw that before and i wouldn't have seen it unless i had them in that viv set up you know the way they wanted it to be set up right. so well, and that's the thing you know so many people you know oh, a long tail grass lizard like that thing's super weird looking it's like a skink that got stretched out into a garter snake yeah and it's like yeah yeah that's the point man like if you <laughs> set them up you'll see it moves like a snake yeah. You know, and then so for us that have kept those things, you know, your your average keeper who doesn't keep nerdy weird things is like, oh, you know, small anecdote in my brain. Oh, that looks weird. I wonder why. Never think about it again because it's just a throwaway lizard. Meanwhile, there's like four of us 
in all of Illinois and Wisconsin. They were going, no, you don't understand. It's it, super cool. It, it's <laughs> like a, it's like a snake in a tree, you know. And if if you never stopped to observe that, or you were never exposed to it, or you never set up an enclosure just to see what would happen for that, it will never occur to you. It will just, oh, anecdote that looks weird, and then fade away. And then you meet somebody like us, and it's like, no, 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 that's the whole. That's the thing. point. But then yeah, I think the, you. The, <laughs> that faded ether anecdote, that's the entire purpose of the animal. And right. it, it's just so important to those people. And I think that's where the disconnect is. Well, and I also don't know if this is a, another rabbit hole we want to go down, but I also think a lot of it might have to do with why are we keeping the animals to begin with? Like, I'm not trying to get rich and make a million dollars breeding animals. I keep them because I enjoy them and I appreciate them and I, I, they're rewarding to keep and I'm learning from them. And so I'm not breeding. Like, I like to call myself a passive breeder. I kind of made that word up because I'm like, I'm not actively trying to breed them. I'll get a boy and a girl and I'll put them together. Ideally they breed. And if they breed cool and if they don't, they're not like evicted. <laughs> they're not on right. like the 2021 plan. I'm getting rid of them because they haven't, you know, held their weight. But there are people who, you know, their animals are investments and their animals are a commodity to them because it's a business. I think you guys sure. have talked yes. about that on one of your podcasts as well. For sure. And yeah. there's no fault. I'm not judging anybody who's doing this because we need the industry people to breed the industry animals. So they're, that's important. But I keep my animals because I enjoy keeping them. I want to learn from them. And it's gratifying if I have a boy and a girl and they're breeding together. That's great because that means... I don't, I feel like they're not going to breed if their basic needs aren't met. So if the temperature is right, the humidity is right, the, the setup is proper, they're going to be happy. They're not going to be stressed and then they'll breed. So if I have animals that are breeding that, okay, I'm, I must be doing things the right way, but I'm not trying to actively breed them. I just want to keep them. I enjoy keeping them. I have geckos that are like, I've had alone. <laughs> Sarah and I were just talking about, it. I have a species from Australia, Strophirus tanicata, the yellow tail gecko and it's like black and white with like a yellow tail and these red eyes and it's gorgeous but i have i've had a lone male now for going on seven years i never got a female and he's but he's so cool to, he's so cool to look at and they're just an amazing animal but i think a lot of times too there are people if i need to make money and this is my business and i have 300 animals and i have a 10 foot by 20 foot space they're going to be in a rack and right you can sure. have them in a rack and you could still have them. Like I do keep some animals in racks. I have some gecko species that I keep in racks because I know the temperature and humidity is proper, but I still have substrates and I don't use live plants, but sure. There's still a bioactivity within that, you know, within that tub too. So keeping animals in racks, you don't necessarily have to compromise the bioactivity, natural substrate at all either. Right. Well, so, and then do you think, Okay, so this entire episode is going to sound like I'm picking on leopard geckos, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> no, they're cool. So, and and I like I have quite a few. Um, they're a very common pet. They've been bred for a very long time. They have some morphs and stuff, and it, it they're fun. Do you think maybe that has kind of colored her pediculture? So the reason I say that is they're prolific, and they're hat. Nowadays, there's a little bit of breeding depression that's starting to come out, and, and some of the morphs have deleterious genes and things. But it mm -hmm. did take quite a long time, so they, they were able time. to be they were able to be mass produced without a lot of uh, negativity for quite some time. Now, again, I'm not trashing on leopard geckos. This is just Never. my opinion. Okay. Um, they're pretty boring. <laughs> All right, they're they're nocturnal. Uh, they don't jump. They're, they don't really climb a whole lot where they live is fairly plain and uniform. Um, the folks from Arcadia did uh, a setup for a leopard gecko. They posted on some of their social media and it was, it was awesome. It's like this cool Rocky field setup, and it, it looks kind of like a tortoise table. Like okay. It's probably you know, like maybe four or five by two. Um, it's shallow. I'm not even sure there was a top on it um in the pit that i could see in the picture and it was long and it was just a really cool like just a strewn rocky field 
And then they did their full spectrum lighting and, and all the things. And they were just growing a couple of succulents, nothing major, like where they would actually be from. Iran and Afghanistan, uh, for those who are listening who've never been there, they're not lush, verdant places. No, it's, they're not. It's it's a barren, rocky area. Right. Um, and it's fairly uniform. Uh, shades of yellow and brown, which would be why a mottled yellow and black lizard does well there at nighttime. Makes perfect sense. So even if you set up that lizard in a way that makes sense for where it's from, I personally think that like desert scenes and, and paintings of the desert and things like that, I think they're beautiful. I really appreciate like the Western style of art and stuff. Um, but if you set that up in your living room, it's going to look cool, but it's really only going to look cool for people that appreciate, you know, a, a painting of a desert scene or, you know, that enjoy keeping a little cactus garden or, or something like it's a specific type of aesthetic for people. Yeah. And so instead you could get an all in one kit 20 long and keep some leopard geckos in it with like a tiki hut and pet type of things. Um, and it, it really kind of downplays that because where they're from is quote unquote boring. Yeah. Right. To where now you and I, you and I are talking about tree skinks and things that you don't really have the interaction level for younger keepers. What you want, you want to hold a leopard gecko or hold yeah. a dragon. That's not really possible for the things that we're talking about, but where they're from is exciting. And it's, it's fun to build it's lush and, and it's, we can yeah. learn about these plants or yeah. Or e and even if you fake it, even if you use silk plants and, and aquarium background or whatever, it, it has a whole different visual appeal, right? There's a reason that the vast majority of house plants are shades of bright and dark green and are bushy and not, and you know, it, it gives people a different feeling. It's a different vibe. Um, so I just wonder if like yeah. her pediculture. I mean, if that's cool, I do have. I am guilty of having. But like, I, oh, I just ahead, wonder sorry. if like her. No, no, I I just wonder if her pediculture has been kind of conditioned with that. Like, you know, after leopard geckos, I would say the next closest thing is bearded dragons, and then crested geckos are probably right there in the running. And for leopard geckos, I mean, they live on rock piles in the desert. You could you could build something cool with that, and I have. I I mean, you know, I use like the pink foam, cover it in glue, cover it in sand, and make fake rocks and stuff. But, dude, I'm I'm just I'm making fake rocks. Like it's not <laughs> it, it it it's fun because I like crafty stuff. But it's not. You know, I didn't plant like a dart frog vivarium. I built yeah. a fake desert. A fake desert is rocks are too heavy, so I made fake ones and then sand. Like it's, it's not, it's a it's lot just, harder. Yeah. I have some Euromastics and I'm trying to do like a big, I, I upgraded by Euromastics. So I have an oscillated Euromastics male and he's in like a 36 by, I don't know, some bigger tank. And then I have a, a, a the, the red ones that I are in a larger tank and I'm trying to figure out like I'm hitting that a, creative. Red. Do, you? do you have need? Do you have need for I have a male a red? Male red also. Uh, I'm looking we could have two males. I um, yeah. I already have this problem. We you know, have women. Are another. <laughs> this could be right. We we always get the males. I have a theory about that. We'll get to that. But um, I um, yeah, it's it's a little bit more challenging setting up a naturalistic enclosure for a desert animal. They look cool, but the plants are dead or they're dry or they're it's right, not it's as washed. And plain. I, I think you can make it cool. But what I thought you were getting at was like. I, cause I was going to, I was going to kind of giggle, like you don't see the leopard gecko. So here you have this 40 breeder tank or this 55 gallon and it's landscaped and it's beautiful, even if it's rocks and branches, but you never, the animal's not walking around, <laughs> you know? right? you know, he's yeah. just hiding. Well, and, but then I have a lot of animals that are like, Hey, here's my cage with dirt in it. Cause the animal burrows and you never see him. Yes. <laughs> like, oh, the, the sand boa problem. The, yeah. I have, pet, I have a, I have a pet tremors. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah look I have, for the rock with. Look for the rock with eyeballs. It's not a rock. It's a snake or lizard face. Lizard, That's lizard all you nose is peeking out. Like, yeah. Why do you have that as a pet? Well, because it's cool. <laughs> so I could tell because when you dig I them up, one. they look really awesome. Yeah. 
No, yeah, landscaping well, that, desert vivs is a little bit more challenging, but I'm I'm trying to figure out the challenge. I'm trying to build like um like I want to make a background for the Euro Mastics and I want to make like rocks that are kind of jutting out. So I want to take like pieces of styrofoam and make them go sideways so they're kind of stacked like this and then use like grout yes. or whatever and but it it is it's challenging to get that aesthetic in a in a deserty kind of a viv. Well, and then so like do, my kind of thought process behind that was like, I think maybe that has colored her pediculture because, and it, it's always been really weird to me that the most popular pets in her pediculture for lizards, bearded dragons make perfect sense, right? Come out in the day, they're rock dwellers. They'll sit yeah. on you. They, they visually communicate. They head Bob, they beard up you, that pet makes perfect sense in my brain okay crested geckos and leopard geckos other than the fact that they're prolific mm -hmm. make no sense to me it, that's leopard a good geckos, question they don't yeah. want to come out in the daytime so when they're crawling around on you they they're kind of slow they don't do a whole lot it's because it's daytime they're they're scared that they're going to be eaten even if they become adjusted to living in the day that's not what they're meant to do. They're always going to be more active at nighttime. So that's weird for a pet, uh, especially for younger people. And everybody always talks about first pets for kids like leopard geckos and stuff. It may just never made sense to me. And then <laughs> crested geckos, crested geckos, major selling point is no equipment. Yeah. Right? They're just, you don't, yeah, you don't have room to, you don't have to worry about heat. Right. It's a little bit of humidity. You can have a big water bowl and spray some stuff. Rock out. So you don't have to worry about bugs. They just eat a, you know, a powder right. mixed Except with water with protein. If you it. try, if you try to hold it, it's going to drop its tail and jump for dear life. And other than that, it wants to crawl up to your face to be the highest point in the room. It, it, it wants nothing to do with you. You're just a giant jungle gym to a lizard that makes its living jumping off of stuff. <laughs> And is also, for the most part, crepuscular. My, yeah. my stuff is most active right before the lights come on. When the lights come on, they'll be kind of looking around. They'll eat a little bit. Um, and when them lights go off, and if especially if it's a night where I'm misting, yeah, well, then, yes. we're, act that, then we're active. That's you when know, the room that lights night. up. You turn the oh, lights yeah. off and you start You're misting, and that's when you see everything. Oh, yeah. Nighttime humidity, we're, we're cranking. Yeah. Um, other than the prolific aspect, how did that become a cool pet? It does. It just never made sense to me. That is interesting. Maybe it, the ease of breeding or how prolific they are. That that makes sense. That is weird. And I could see a little bit more with crusties, but yeah, it's interesting that a desert dwelling nocturnal. Maybe it's their cute faces because they look like they're smiling, and that's what everyone loves. And I, I'm not crapping yes, on leopard geckos either. I, they're awesome animals. I think they're really cool. Oh no, I have um, half a dozen, but. I just, it was always weird to me. I was like, dude, get a blue tongue skink. Yeah. Like, it'll eat a strawberry. It'll eat a strawberry out of your fingers in the middle of the day. You know, it's the size of a bearded dragon. If you don't want the, the very hot setup or you're worried about, you know, if it's a little kid, you don't want yeah. to climb on them or, or things like that. It just was always weird to me. And I, I'm That's hilarious. I never thought about that before. <laughs> See, I, I'm kind of biased because I've always been on the bigger lizards and like mid-sized snakes were better pets in my mind because they, yeah. again, we do so many shows with kids. I'm always worried about things being able to take a beating. You know, a six-year-old can just pick up my tegu like it's holding a cat. He doesn't care. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. And then like a, a beard, a bearded dragon, I'll just stick it to your shirt when you're at a boy scout meeting and you can walk around, yeah. hang out, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm reading the chat here. I don't know if you can see as they pop up. Oh, uh, wait, no, Sandra, I only see. Hold on. Here we go. Oh uh, gosh. I didn't even see. I was on the wrong thing. I was on private chat. I'm like, Hey, no one's talking. <laughs> um, Cassandra had just said that her crested gecko loves to be held in no drop tail. I have noticed. So I have a male that has not dropped his tail. Um, despite the fact that he is also bred, which is a little weird. That doesn't normally happen. Um, and then Ron was saying how crested geckos are cute. I agree. Uh, crested geckos do have the cute face, much like a leopard gecko. That yeah. does play into it for a lot of people. I think it especially, does. Especially geckos are well, and especially new people. You know, we, we talk about this with the rescue all the time. 
you know, we are not trying to convince kids to be new keepers. We are trying to explain to their parents why it would be okay for them to help their kid keep an animal. Yeah. Um, and if you are a parent who is not, or, or any adult really, who is not a fan of scaly things or you're uncomfortable or you're uncertain, um, how they look and the fact that they do look disarming, they do look like they're smiling and, and the cute factor that absolutely plays into marketability for an animal. Um, when Cassandra was saying about uh, her crested gecko not dropping the tail, I've noticed that with my male. Um, I had a secondary male and he dropped just nothing. He, he was literally walking on my hand and just doop, dropped it off. Done. Um, and then the male that I'm speaking about now, we've had him for going on five years um, and full tail, just chilling. And I, I know for a fact he's made babies around that tail and, and not lost it. Um, Good for him. Good job, dude. And I, I do <laughs> wonder, I mean, maybe that, so that has to be, there's some variability there, right? And it, that has to be a statistical type of thing as well. Because when you talk about the tails, you're talking about an adaptation where they're going to drop it in the event of a predatory action. Mm -hmm. And because we captive breed things, everything passes on and everything continues, good or bad, you know, morphs and lineages and so on and so forth. Um, there's every potential that there are whole populations of crested geckos in captivity that aren't dropping their tails uh, because in New Caledonia, they would have got eaten by a bird because they didn't drop their tail. Y you know, they, they didn't get rid of the bait for the bird. So then they got snatched and we didn't ever find them because they're in a bird gut somewhere. Um, <laughs> but getting in your basement, not dropping that tail wasn't a negative effect for them. Um, it's probably always going to be a, a little bit more of an issue with females, you know, due to laying eggs and, and the muscles involved in that area of the body. Um, but as far as males not dropping, I would bet that there's at least a little bit of that at play in that maybe that, that lizard wouldn't have made it past getting eaten. And he did because he lives in your basement. Because he now he lives in captivity. You bring up some really good points that I don't think I've thought about before. But I think <laughs> maybe like the crested gecko temperaments or something that could be, you know, this gecko, this male, you know, you started the vacuum cleaner and he dropped his tail and went bonkers. And For then sure, his, yes. his genes are all, are all going to be vacuum tail bonker geckos where this guy you could like, you know, play catch with and he's keeping his tail and his genes are going to be robust. And I never thought about that. I don't well, know. And, I mean, that, <laughs> that, I don't know. I don't want to say it's been proven, but anecdotally folks have been noticing that um, in the long-term breeding of snakes, yeah. you know, it went not outside of morphs and things like that. Um, folks are starting to pick up on their breeding snakes that are good eaters. You know, if it comes out of the egg snappy and ready to go and it's sucking down food, then it's people are showing that strong feeding response, babies starting earlier, getting the calories, in, you know, and, and growing well developmentally is passing on. So you they're, know, it's becoming they're growing up and having folks. babies that are also strong feeding sure. response. Thanks. That's For really sure. cool. And, it, and, and you know, if, if you get weird stuff like anteresia i know we're now on a snake tangent for a lizard thing but that's okay um you know when you're sitting there you're force feeding and worrying about lizards and so on and so forth and then you got two of them that just take rodents right out of the gate all right well man those are the two i'm breeding yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. those are my whole they packs did, they, they yeah. did what i wanted everybody else can worry about the force feeding i gotta go <laughs> you know like that's um i haven't had a yeah. lot of crusties drop tails though either but i don't spend really? a lot of time no, I've had a couple, but I don't have, I'm not the, I want to hold my animals and interact with them kind of a guy. Like, I mean, True. I, the, the animals that I have for education, I do. So the snakes, the tortoises, the lizards that I would bring to an educational show, the animals that I want kids to handle on a regular basis, I will handle on a regular basis. But sure. a lot of my skinks and geckos, I just want to let them be. So I don't, I don't interact a lot with my, you know, some of my leopard geckos or some of my crusties or, you know, whatever. And so maybe that's why I'm not trying to pick them up and hang out with them all the time. I'll right. check on them and make sure they're healthy looking and there's no stuck sheds and stuff. So maybe that's why I haven't had a lot of tail drops. We'll see. And then that is going to play into it as well, because someone like me, 
you know, the, the rate of human interaction for a lot of the stuff in my collection is significantly higher Very high. yeah. than, than, mo than most folks. So yeah, that's going to color my perspective for sure. Yeah, maybe. Um, and then Cassandra, I see Cassandra also asked, have I, we owned African fat tails? I currently have a female. I don't had, have any I've, right now, but I used I've to. I've had several in the past. Uh, right now we have a female. Uh, hopefully I don't get sued for copyright infringement. Her name is Mrs. Buttersworth. Because my son says she looks like syrup. <laughs> so, yeah, they're cool. They're they're very cool geckos. I did work with them. I don't work with them now, but I've had them in the past. Um, they're they're awesome. So I, I have like found them. that they are way more hardcore on the being nocturnal than yeah, my leopard are. geckos. They're um, a lot feistier. I, the ones I've had are a lot feistier. Um, my guy isn't, or girl, sorry, isn't, um, feisty toward me, but is a way, um, not necessarily, I don't want to say a better feeder, but, um, has a much stronger feeding response. Yeah. Um, if, if you're dropping food in, especially at nighttime, that lizard's coming to get it. Um, whereas my leopard geckos, they eat mealworms out of a cup. Like they're, they're starting to see, it really bugs me when people say how, um, oh, Cats and dogs are domesticated and reptiles aren't. That is oh, nonsense. Yeah. I'm telling you what, leopard geckos, albino Burmese pythons, that those things are domesticated. They are yeah. derpy and they are not wild animals. They don't no. act like it. And I, I'm going to say that with a giant disclaimer because I do education and stuff. Don't be an idiot and do incorrect things with big snakes like Burmese pythons. Right. However, asterisk, however, Albino Burmese pythons in 2020 are derpy and they're, and they're not wild animals. They, no. they have been bred to the point of domestication in my opinion. Um, and leopard geckos and stuff are the same way, man. Like I oh, got like 36 generations of leopard geckos now. I yeah, think and <laughs> they eat, they eat are leaning more towards domestication. Oh, than yeah. wild. Dude, they, <laughs> they eat dusted mealworms and um, From a bowl. Uh, fixed diet out of a bowl. Yeah. They, they're exactly like my dog. It isn't dog yeah. food because it's the it's the squishy diet. But he eats out of a bowl. He drinks out mm -hmm. of a bowl, and he walks toward my hand. He's 140 pounds, so not in my hand. My leopard geckos eat out of a bowl. They drink out of a bowl and walk in my hand. That's yeah. domesticated. That's I mean, pretty come on. domesticated. Yeah. Yeah. No, I so agree. We're talking about a a whole smorgasbord of species here. And yeah, we go in different tangents my, too. We're going. All oh yeah, over we're this. we're wandering. We're wandering. Um, one of my big questions for you and that I wanted people, the, the tens of listeners that we have currently, um, <laughs> all of our friends, wanted, what's up guys? Shout out, yeah, Shout out, we man. all, we, we know all of them. Um, what I wanted people to hear, especially from you because of, of the diversity of species that you have and, and all these different things that some of the folks who are listening may have never even heard of, of several of these, where First of all, where do you find them? Like, are, are you, you know, perusing classifieds or are you going to shows looking for these things or are there specific places? And then in addition to that, um, wh where are you doing your research? Wh where are you, where did you look up stuff about the three different varieties of tree skinks that you and I just discussed? Um, Joe Hupp and Joe Hupp. <laughs> yeah, Joe yes, is my yeah, research, copy, and Joe Hupp's where I get the copy. E copy everything he does. Yes. No, and actually, there's a there's a there's a really cool. I'll have to connect you. Um, there's a there's a larger group of gecko nerds. Um, you know, Joe Hupp is one of them. Wally Kern is one of them. Um, yep, Richie also, Lillet, Mike Walsh. Um, yep. Richie Lillet, Mike Walsh, Nathan Hall out in Austin, uh, the Austin Reptile. Um, ah, what's the name of his company? Um, Nathan Hall is a huge gecko nerd. He knows, he knows his stuff. There's, I can, there's a couple dozen guys that I know like hardcore in the gecko hobby. Um, Clint Reinhardt, I talk to all the time on Facebook. He's a cool dude. So there is that little niche of gecko people. And maybe we can use this blog to bring some of these gecko people out of the woodwork and really kind of talk some of this stuff. Um, yes. I, Ryan is an enabler and Ryan knows a lot of animals and he knows a lot of people that have the animals. And so Agreed. Ryan will, <laughs> hey, have you I hope seen you're this? Listening hey, have you to heard this, about Ryan? this? I hope you're, yeah, right. Um, so he's an enabler. Um, just, you know, like, 
oh, hey, there's this cool, I'll find a random gecko at a table or find a random gecko at a pet shop. And I'll like, what is this animal? And then I'll go, oh, this is from this genus. There's 13 other in this genus and this is what they're about. So kind of like that backwards research. Here's this specific animal. Let me learn about this specific animal, different species in that genus, learn about the genus, learn about the family and kind of go that way. Um, some animals have care sheets. Some animals, you kind of, it's trial and error to a degree. You know, if I get an animal and I'm not sure how to set it up, I'll kind of just set up like a general, like here's a viv. I'll have a wet side, a dry side, branches, whatever. So then I can observe it and be like, okay, it likes the drier side in the tree. It's a less air. It's a more arid, less tropical, whatever. That seems to be the environment it likes. So, oh, it's really spending all its time over here. You know, so you kind of trial and error a little bit. Um, but like, like the Isle of Tree Skinks, for example, you know, when we got that group in, you got some, I got some. And um, those babies are legit really cool, by the way, dude. They're awesome. And yeah. they're like, they're beasts. Um, and I have another clutch of eggs in the incubator too. I found six more eggs. So I've got, hopefully they're coming soon. Um, where are they from? And then finding out where they're from and then researching rainfalls and, and temperatures. And, you know, Indonesia is tropical and it's pretty much the same humidity year round. It's kind right. of the same temperatures. It has a little bit of a cool season. And so that really helps with animals from that area because it's just yeah, the same. Buying equatorial you know, stuff is cheating. <laughs> yeah, because it's all the same, <laughs> yes. you know, whatever. I got a pair. I went to... um a lot of, most of the time it, it happens randomly. It's, it's more of me stumbling upon something and less of me actively searching for something. And so a lot of the times it's just me kind of randomly going, I went to, um, I was at the NARBC in Arlington and there was these um, Madagascar water skinks, they're called. And I mm -hmm. Google and yes. do a little bit of research. Amphiglossus reticulatus. So I have 1.1 yes. 1. 1. and I could tell they're a male and a female because the one has a larger head. He's a little bit more robust. I haven't gotten any eggs yet from them. They're incub they're when they lay eggs, it seems like eggs only ha like hatch a few weeks after they're laid, it seems from what I've been reading. So as soon as they lay eggs, they only hatch like 3 weeks later, which seems very strange. So I got to do a little bit more digging. I know a few people that have them, but it's where are they from and what are they, you know, it, it, there's no care sheet. So it's okay, well they live in rivers, they live in riverbanks, they live in this part of Madagascar and kind of modifying my care that way. Um Okay. So that's my research. It's, you know, it's more, it's more researching places and not animals, so to speak. It's researching the animal and finding the information that I can. Google Scholar, awesome. Always use Google Scholar. And it's looking at where they're from in the regions. Or like, you know, I, I don't have a care sheet for this animal, but they're from this part of Malaysia. So is this other animal that has a care sheet. Okay, so right. maybe there's similarities. You know, I, you know, if we found another random weird lizard that no one's ever seen before, but they're from Afghanistan, Afghanistan, we could be, oh, okay, so maybe the care is similar to a leopard gecko because that's where they're both from. Um, right. But it's a, it, there, there's a trial and error piece to, to working with them as well and, 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 and observing them and getting them in and, and watching and learning from having them too, which I don't recommend. Like, always know what you're getting into, but. <laughs> well, and I think. So just listening to you describe that, I think would also play into why you, you also clearly take enjoyment from, from building enclosures and, and doing things and doing the bioactive stuff. But it, it seems like it, it would be more important to you because you are experimenting with these things and because you're taking in animals that quite often are going to be imports. They're, they're typically going to be wild caught. We don't know yeah. a whole lot about it, you know? Um, and that, that does that has to happen for us to be able to establish them when right. when they aren't established. That's just how it is. Um, but then it is incumbent upon you to recreate the environment. So mm -hmm. now it it helps that you enjoy it, but that needs to be part of your skill set because if you just kept it in a sterile enclosure and then you were based off of that, starting to guess on your parameters when you have the stress of being wild caught and, and the different things that come with that, it puts you too far behind the eight ball. You know, there's a chance yeah. you're not going to catch up if you're too dry or too wet or what, or, you know, temperature ranges aren't where you think that maybe they should be. And you have that sterile enclosure. There isn't a buffer zone. No, you know, there's so not. Now, 
it's starting out with some tree skinks that you hadn't really heard much about before and just building your basic Indo enclosure with those parameters gives you a head start. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? So then like, then like you were saying, okay, so now they're spending all their time in the dry or they're spending all their time in the humid. Okay. Well, as I change my uh, parameters, I'll make the entire enclosure more dry and just have a humid hide. Okay. so now what are they doing? Oh, they're out all the time. Everything's cool. You know, in the nighttime, they're in the humid hide rock on. Okay. I was right. You know, Oh, I, I dried the cage out and they never leave that humid hide. Okay. Well, I screwed up somewhere. So now we're going to go back up, you know, start back to center line. Um, but you, you need to have those skills and you need to have that enclosure. Maybe not necessarily full on bioactive, but it needs to be pretty close to the real world because you are a little bit kind of shot in the dark guessing here based off of what research you can get, which your, your research on the animal might not exist. You literally are researching a place. You know what I mean? Like you, you and I were talking about a pluris. I was just going to get on those. Yep. Yeah. We, we had a couple of papers, but for the most part, um, a lot of the papers I found were based off of some of the national parks there. Right. And they didn't have a whole lot to do with the lizard. They had to do with the park. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to start building stuff off of what I can find off of pictures and what it looks like at this park. And then yeah, I'll you, see what this thing uses. You, you get know a five I mean? page paper and, it, and there's one it, paragraph that mentions them. We have these here. Oh, well, thanks. Right. For and it's just like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Cause I was actually looking at this tree and then this lizard was in it. So I wrote it down right. and you're like, oh, uh, okay. I guess I'll just fake that tree and see what the that lizard one like. Tree That's there. literally what I did. Yeah. Like I dude, both of my males are they're in two separate enclosures because they do not get along. Um I, and I learned that but, the hard way too. Yeah. Yeah. I I faked and I, I actually took um <laughs> I cut down a cherry tree in my yard, so I have like full on big logs in there. Um right. got rid of the bugs, cooked them out so that they were okay. No Illinois creatures are gonna bother my Madagascar creatures. And um <laughs> you know I I stacked all these things on a piece of plywood, screwed them in from the bottom, and I made a dry forest in an enclosure out of cherry tree limbs that are like, it's super heavy. They're like the size of my calf. They're humongous. Um, It was stupid. It it was way too big. And he loves it, but it was far too intense. Um, Dried the whole thing out. You know, he's got a very dry substrate, uh, a decent water bowl, but he spends almost no time around it drinks a little bit, wants nothing to do with it underneath the heat lamp, getting in the, the bark and sticking his face in there and trying to get mealworms. And like, he is a tree living dry creature yeah. because I'm watching him use that. Um, and that entire thing was off the papers that you and I saw, you sent me some on Facebook messenger. And yeah. then I just started researching that one national park and I was like, okay, I'll just fake it and see what happens. Um, and it worked. Fortunately for me, it, it worked. Fortunately, it works a lot. I mean, I'm not going to brag, but most of the time it works for me. Those animals stumped me. And actually, I wanted to ask you this question because one of the things I noticed with them is um, I gave them a little bit of a thicker, like a little bit of a deeper substrate. And it was, I kind of mm-hmm. mixed jungle mix and sand together. So it was kind of loamy and easy to burrow in. And they burrowed yes. a lot. And so, but I was thinking, yes. are they burrowing because they like to burrow or are they burrowing because... I'm not, I don't have their cage right. And they're stressed out, but also maybe because so, I had two males together thinking it was a pair and observing them going, so, I don't think that's a pair. <laughs> I think those are two so boys. The, the smaller of the two males, um, he's in a, he's in his own 40 breeder and I have, um, a little bit of a deeper substrate in that. And then his, he's got two vertical trees and, um, several horizontal logs um, he has made his own little area underneath the horizontal logs and he does sleep there. Um, he comes out and baths in the morning and does his own thing. He has a smaller water bowl. Again, he's a, a rare drinker. I tried misting at nighttime and they didn't really seem to care because they're, they're full on, like they go to sleep. So they're, they're not out getting yeah. the, the nighttime humidity. Uh, so I, I kind of skipped that the larger male. 
I don't know if it's just a, a byproduct of he was used to kind of showing off for the other ones when they were kept together or what. Um, he spends the majority of his time out and he's, he's got his bulldog shoulders. He's, he's huge, man. right? He's way bigger. Yeah. Oh yeah. Which is why I thought they might've been, cause his colors were a little different. So that's what I thought. Maybe it's a male and a female. Yeah. Or then I started thinking maybe they're two different species and that's where you and I were starting to collaborate. And for you guys listening, we're talking about Oplurus colvieri, which is called, I think their common name is the Madagascar collared iguana. <laughs> um, yes. They kind of look like a big, they look like if a collared lizard and a bearded dragon had a baby, like they kind of look like that. Like they have a yes. collared lizard kind of appearance, a bearded dragon kind of body. They're a gomids. Um, but I had found one in a pet shop it, that was just called lizard. Like it was so generic and they didn't know what it was. And it was like 30 bucks. I think I'm like, I'll take it. And then a buddy was like, Oh, Hey, you got those. I have a pair. And then he sent them to me, but then I'm like, these aren't a pair. And then we were trying to figure out, and that's when I'm like, Hey, you want these bills? <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and that's where yeah. like, that's an example. I'm not I, sure. I, I kind of struggled with them. Yeah. And I was, that was in one of my downsizing phases as well. I'm like, I have too many things. I need to pick some of these projects and let some of these go. But yeah, they're cool animals and I'm glad that well, you figured that out. So I, th that's my thing is that big male, he, he shows off. He's clearly the man. Um, and, but same as the other guy, he, he gets down to sleep and he, he sleeps out of sight and, you know, light cycle comes out, does his thing during the day. I'm the man looking around, showing off. Um, he doesn't do nearly as much searching around, checking in the, the bark for the food. And he, he straight up eats out of my hand. And he, I don't think, I, I think he's, he's a little bit, I'm perched up checking my territory and a little bit, I kind of, fattened him up so he knows that I'll give him food and I can't decide if it's behavior that's natural or if I'm causing a little bit of it. Um, the other guy, he just, he's always looked skittish and I don't, I really don't, yeah. I don't know how to explain that he looks skittish, but he's always kind of, he's lizard got that shoulder know. turn. <laughs> yeah. Lizard yeah. people get it. He's got, we, that know, what, we know exactly what you're talking about where he's sitting there. Like if you open the lid, I'm um, ghost. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he's always just kind of ready. Um, it took forever, forever to get him to eat off tongues. Um, and he's still, if you open the lid, he does the side jump, like getting ready to bolt. And then he sees the silver tongs and it's like, Oh, okay. That dude's oh, got you have food. I, I understand. Yeah. But he's always ready to just beat it. Whereas that big male, there's no, he ain't leaving. Like you can open the door and stick your head. And I have, cause I changed light bulbs. Um, you can open the door and stick your head in there. And he is just watching. Like if you come by this tree, I will 100% bite you. He doesn't run away. Um, and now there really isn't as much of a size discrepancy as there was before. Oh, right. On. So That's it's, cool. it's weird that the, the sub male. Yeah. He's grow. He's growing up sub like he, he <laughs> he's he's a he's an adult male like there's nothing wrong with him but he just kind of looks like somebody beat on him you, you yeah. know what i mean he, he just bad. always wants to pull i was away a, a female bit. no I no see, I mean, he's, tom, he's perfectly healthy some guy named tom tom sturm commented we're taught i don't know if you're asking about me bill or his bill him bill <laughs> uh, this um, bill that that is definitely my in-laws coming to make fun of me on my live stream. Appreciate that, oh, Tom. Right on. Awesome. We um we're talking about a genus of lizard from Madagascar. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Like I have I have New Caledonian geckos. So we have, you know, I work with Chihua and Sarasa Norm. I like Cressies are cool. Gargs are amazing. I love gargoyle geckos and I love Chihuahuas. Um, and I I don't keep the white collar Sarasinorum, but the just the regular okay. Corolophus Sarasinorum, and they're calmer. I you know I can go in their vib and I can switch their stuff out, and they'll jump on my shoulder, and then they'll just kind of like, hey, what's going on? Just kind of hang out with me. So that is a little bit of an interaction. Um, I do have the tree skinks. I'm trying to think if there's anything I have that I haven't 
touched on. I keep a group of jeweled Lacertas. So Ooh. you were talking about That's blue tongue cool. skinks as a pet. And so I would jump on the bandwagon. No offense to bearded dragons because I think they're awesome. But everyone who owns I, a bearded dragon should think about owning a Euromastix because they're yes. so cool. And then everyone who wants a Tegu, but like, oh, I want a Tegu, but they're too big. Lacertas, jeweled Lacertas yes. are absolutely phenomenal. They don't they get huge, list. but they're so their 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 behaviors are so incredible. And I have a, I have a trio. I'm actually going through right now. I'm kind of paying attention to them because I I had 1.2. But now I'm speculating on one of them who I'm worried is a male, and I think he's. They were sold to me as a as a trio, as a male and two females. But as they're getting right. older, I'm wondering if one of the females is actually a male. So I need to spend some time with them this weekend or this week. But um, just an absolutely incredible, incredible animal, and I treat them like tegus, like they're in a bigger viv, and they have some branches to climb, they have some spots to burrow. They'll definitely eat out of a bowl. I can taunt feed them, and they're 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 insane. They're so much fun to watch, and they're so quirky. So, yeah, I'm on the I'm definitely on the Lacerta the Lacerta bandwagon. They're fantastic animals. So, for folks that are listening or, or watching, as it were, um, and you've you've heard us say about whether or not it's a male or a female, and and sometimes we've messed up. Um, so, do <coughs> I have had so many animals that have been in that sub role yeah um from a 40 inch argus monitor to a rhinoceros iguana where they were just exposed from a very young age to a large dominant male and they just did not develop as much they were very subservient they were healthy they just weren't <laughs> very big um i mean our rhinoceros iguana we uh, adopted a pair or what we th were told was a pair of them from a situation where a man had passed away and his widow was not in the hobby and, and she didn't know. Um, she, she had no information or knowledge whatsoever. And so his friend was trying to, you know, sell them and move them for her because she was not involved. And so I, I ended up with some animals through that uh, Avenue and we get them. And the male was elderly. It was <laughs> very old iguana um oh. healthy cool just kind of on the old man trend you know not moving as quick and, and so on and so forth and the smaller one what you know no pores to speak of no no <clears throat> wax coming out of the pores very small uh horns for rhinoceros iguana which is a, a male characteristic for sure um fairly skittish it's 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 an iguana. So eventually got over it. you know, take treats and, and fruit and things with sugar from us. So that was easier and trying to get her, her that we thought to uh, be a little more chill with us. It's like 18 months in and the older male passes away. And so, you know, he's now removed from the equation and over the ensuing 18 months after that male had passed away, our quote unquote female, doubles in size wow. wax is now is is now just dripping down her pores and she's got a he now clearly has got a horn on his face and he will just full-on headbutt you um he, wow. he's a male he, he had been in that subservient role um and then when that dominant male passed away now it's his time uh our argus monitor was the same way people always tell me that we have a huge argus monitor and i and i always respond with no you don't understand the lady <laughs> that we adopted him from thought it was a female she obviously was never successful in breeding them but her male was a monster i mean her yeah. male was every bit as long as i am tall he was a wow. gigantic just huge lizard and then there's this what now people tell me is a big Argus monitor in there. And we had, we adopted him, her at the time and brought her home and had some weird gender interactions where she was like posted up on Teresa and was weird with me and just some strange interactions that you kind of notice with big lizards. Um, again, it's like a year, 18 months later, we're at a show it starts to rain ground gets wet of course all the lizards are going to poop because we're outside at a show and he goes to 
uh, evacuate and just huge penis straight out. <laughs> and I was like, that's not a girl. And that is... that's why, that's why they never got eggs. Cause that's, that's a why 40 it doesn't inch, like me. that's a 40 inch male lizard. Females don't have giant penises. And Teresa, <laughs> Teresa turns around and is like, Oh my God, that totally explains why we had all that weird stuff happen where he was trying to post up and claim me as his girlfriend because he's not a girl, you know? That's and so, crazy. But it, for any lizard, like I don't, again, when we were talking about how it's kind of weird between snake and lizard people, if you don't keep animals in these social groups and see these interactions and have piles of skinks or a couple of iguanas, you, you never... Like that's so foreign to a person with snakes. It's like, yeah, you probe them or you pop them and you get boys and girls and it's, move out. No, it's and very foreign. Yeah. And then actually and that brings up a good point too. Cause I see Cassandra asked the question, have we owned a fire skink or a red eye croc skink? I've owned them both. I have a fire skink right now, but sometimes like skinks are incredibly difficult to sex. You know, and there are there's some sure. species that are dimorphic where the males are differently colored than the females. Um, there's some characteristics where males maybe have a more triangular shaped, larger head where females have a more narrow head. But skinks are incredibly difficult to sex. And so having a group of skinks and observing their interactions with each other and observing their behaviors is sometimes a, a way to sex them. You know, I have four skinks and that one's sitting up way there and this one's over there and this is over there. Okay, well, that one's a female because she's, you know, whatever. Oh, those two are mating. So that one's clearly a male and a female. <laughs> but sometimes it's it's hard to just sex yes, them. That does help. <laughs> yeah. Okay, those ones are breeding. So that's, you know, this one beat this other one up. Let me separate well, him. Also He's a male. Figure... Well, you also have to figure that when we talk about sexual dimorphism, um, I think a lot of people, well, that's probably more people outside the hobby, but people, when they talk about sexual dimorphism, go to things like lions, right? It's got yeah. a mane. It's a boy. Yeah, like, it's a boy. No, like, so Bill just said, you know, oh, a triangular head, more bulky, so on and so forth. Except we all know that a major problem in modern herpeticulture is overfeeding and things are a little fat. Yeah. So yeah, a bulkier head or a thick or thicker tail base and so on and so forth. Yes. If you were to go to Indonesia and take a sampling of tree skinks and then bring them back, you could measure those things and get your calipers out. And that would pretty much jive statistically. Okay. Well, that's not going to work at or, somebody's house it, that feeds stuff waxworms like yeah. that. You know, it, they all it look doesn't like always breakfast fall burritos with manner. legs sticking out. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Also, fire skinks are are beautiful, and the ones the every single one that I've ever had are just mean little feisty things that want to bite you. And then I had a buddy once, my friend John, who um, had a fire skink, and then when he moved out, I took his fire skink. That's actually the one that I still have, and um, I've had him now for four going on five years. I think it might be even longer. And when John had the fire skink. It would hang out on his shoulder and it was really tame and he could pick it up and he could hold it. And it was a little skittish coming out of the cage, but once he had it out of the cage, he could interact with it. And I took it on and it hates me. <laughs> like I, I don't get to enjoy the skink the way John got to. And he'd sit on his shoulder and he'd be whatever. And that skink hates me now. Um, and I do try to interact with it occasionally, but I, I also, like I said earlier, I don't really interact with I don't play with them and hold them every day and do all that kind of stuff. Plus I have like a couple hundred animals. So it would be a lot to interact with them all regularly. I'm in their cage I daily. I fully understand. <laughs> you know, every day I'm in their cage or every other day I'm in their cage misting and looking at them and cleaning their water sure. dishes out and stuff like that. But I'm not like petting them and playing with them and you know, whatever. So maybe that's why they all hate me. Cause I'm just the food guy. I'm just the janitor. Like I said, and I'm, you know, <laughs> well, but you are, you are just a byproduct of their environment. Yeah. You know, you, you're, you, you are the controller of the parameters and the bringer of the food. Yep. Y you know, and there really isn't much more beyond that. You know, like we, we talk about Teresa with the big lizards all the time where honestly, when it comes to feeding and, and watering and stuff, a lot of that is me and the kids. And then for Teresa, she, definitely helps clean and, and do different stuff. But a, a big part of her interactions with the large lizards is 
the interaction. That's awesome. You know, she, yeah. she is the person getting it out. It's climbing on her and all these other things. Whereas the kids and I are filling water and raking dirt and changing mulch and stuff like that. We're not that interaction. So it probably doesn't view us in the same way or interact in the same way because that isn't what's happening where, you know, you're in the same boat. Yeah. They're obviously much smaller. So that's going to change the parameters too, because of how they would, you know, react to something much larger than them and the whole bird foot, scary hand thing. Um, but just there, the number of times in a given day or in a given period of time that you are in their environment. Well, the only things that change when you're in my environment are the humidity, my water and food access. You know, I'm not flying through the air all of a sudden. <laughs> and it, you know, it's not changing from being inside my drawer to being out in a big lit room. And there aren't these big changes. It's just these right. small things, your presence and the difference of you being there are really small changes in my environment. It's not big, crazy things. So there really are and hopefully no good ones too. Like now I right. have water and here's my food. Right. So there would be no stress. <laughs> the humidity is just right. Uh. Right. But like I, we always acknowledge that like what we do with our animals when we do shows and things can be a stressor. So you, yeah. you know, you pick, you, you pick species that it, it doesn't stress them as much and you work with them and, and get them attuned to that. So it isn't a negative for them. Um, but you are still working through the potential for that to be a stressor. You know, for you, you, when you interact with your collection, very low stress, very low yeah. stress for you, very low stress for them. And it's like, okay, fire skink time to surf to the shoulder in the sky. All right. Well now we're changing the stress level for stuff. And I don't like right. that. Y yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I, I just think point. that's more a, that's a byproduct of your style of keeping and your schedule and, and things of that nature. And it, it's also going to be a little bit species choice as well. I, I always go back to the, like, I'm that one idiot. That's like, no, you don't understand. Huge things are awesome. They're less scared of you, you know, little tiny things. You're scary because you're a giant and you look like bird feet hands. And that's scary. It's always going to have that stress level. And I think Billy froze and I got a message that said he glitched out and is now frozen in his face. So hopefully we'll get him back. Otherwise I will be talking to a blank screen while all of you listen. Let's see if we can add him back to the stream. Oh, nope. He's completely gone. Awesome. So everyone, all the tens of people who are wandering around, you should comment something and I'll talk about lizards with you. <laughs> all right, folks. So Billy just told me, uh, sorry, I froze. Then my computer made a crazy buzzing sound, then totally shut off. So. I think because we are at the hour and 28 mark, we are going to end out on episode one of lizard brain radio and Billy is going to try and reboot. So things that I wanted to mention with Billy are, he is a member of the Madison area herpetological society. He's actually the Milwaukee chapter president. And if you listen to the last episode of the reptile room confessions podcast, Billy is also a licensed therapist and has been using reptiles in therapy uh, with some of his patients and some of the different things that he does. He recently uh, rented a storefront for that purpose. And so when I post the show and here in a little bit, when the live stream comes down, I'll put in the comments either on YouTube or Facebook or wherever you folks happen to be seeing this. Uh, we will list all of the different links for you to check out both the Madison area herpetological society and Billy's work in therapy with his reptiles and Ron, my thoughts on tegus are tegus are amazing because you can hibernate them, which means you don't have to pay to heat and feed them for a big portion of the year, which is awesome. And tegus are amazing because the more you treat big lizards like dogs, the more they will act like them, which 
is probably not a popular opinion that a bunch of people will disagree with, but that's why I have a podcast so I can say whatever I want. Uh, no, I'm just messing around. We honestly do though. We treat our big lizards. We pet them. They crawl on our laps. We, they sit on us. We walk them on leashes. We interact with them in public shows. They eat out of bowls. They eat off of plates. Um, we try to treat them like a quote unquote domesticated fur pet to the largest extent possible. And they have responded in kind. Uh, we've been really successful with that. And I, I know there are things like uh, gold tegus and Nile monitors and stuff that are stereotypically very defensive and, and people struggle with them and things like that. And that is true. Um, I, I would never downplay that. Those animals and those particular species are a great deal of work. Uh, but when you talk about things like black and white tegus and blue tegus, um, it, it really is night and day difference. And I think I'm going to be able to add Billy back and he'll be able to tell you about his stuff that I literally just told everyone. I, I'm on my, Are you alive? I'm on my cell phone now. I didn't know if I could even do this on my phone. Oh. I was talking to you alive and, and well. then all of a sudden I saw my screen froze and then you froze and then my screen went black and like buzzed for like 20 seconds. And then my whole laptop just shut off. Like that was it's so transformers taking it, take it over. I think so. So now my computer's rebooting, but I've never seen anything like that happen before. Um, I really hope it didn't freak out and fry. No, it's so, working. Uh, I'm going to try and get back on on my laptop, but for now I'm back. So uh, we're at the hour and a half mark. So while you were gone, I basically tried to end the episode, but no, you're good. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. Before we, I, I mentioned some of the stuff that you're involved with. Uh, before we go, I definitely want you to mention all of that. And then when things post and for the show notes on the podcast, I'm going to put a link to Madison Area Herb Society. Yes. Um, so if you want to tell folks the different things you're involved with, with reptiles, I, I mentioned the Madison Herb Society. I mentioned that uh, on the Confessions podcast, you had talked about some of your therapy work. Yeah. So spill it out, man. So let, let people know. In the reptile world, I am uh, the president of the Milwaukee chapter of the Madison Area Herb Society. So you can follow madisonherps.org is the website. We could follow. You can follow us on Facebook. I do volunteer with Friends of Scales Reptile Rescue, um, and I am uh, I do foster with them as well. Um, I also have um, WPS Reptiles. Um, we do have a Facebook page. We are building a website. That's more of where I'm going to be selling some of my animals that um, I breed. But again, like I said, I'm more of a passive breeder and not an active one. But um, I don't have anything available at the moment. We had some crested geckos, but we just sold them. But WPS Reptiles is um, where I have my animals. And I that we're going to be posting more of animals that we're working with different geckos and different uh, other oddball reptiles that we have. Sarah, my girlfriend is the, um, she's the whole behind the scenes for that. So that's all her. That's not even me. Um, and then in the therapy world, I'm the owner of uh, impact child and family therapies. And we are on Facebook. I could uh, send you links when we get done with this call. If you wanted to post them, uh, impact child awesome. and family therapies is in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where we do, um, in home work with uh, children with different mental health diagnoses and their families. And, you know, when we did the reptile room confessions podcast, I did talk a little bit about how um, I use reptiles in some of the sessions with some of the kids where we can use reptiles to, for sensory motor activities and for processing feelings and learning coping skills and stuff. So I've been pretty fortunate to be able to do what I do in the reptile hobby. And I'm very excited about, uh, you know, the people that we know and the community that we get to be a part of. And I like being able to bring reptiles into the work that I do as well. And it's very cool. <laughs> so before we go, uh, for everyone who is going to listen to this and for those folks who are live, you also need to go to TikTok and look up WPS reptiles because Sarah as Bill said, his, <laughs> his girl, his girlfriend, Sarah is, uh, the driving force behind his social media. She is. And sh she records bunches of their animals, which is super cool. And then with or without his knowledge, she records Billy all the time. 
and it's hilarious and you should follow them on social media if just for that it's awesome i think there's a uh, video so on tiktok I, where i was showing her one of my curly hair tarantulas and then it ran up my back and i was trying to get it and i wasn't scared yeah, and there's, of me uh, but i was there, worried about him splatting and falling on the ground so i was like really nervous that he was gonna jump and hurt himself the one that i love is you running out i don't i don't even know where you were but you're going to get wood pieces from the dumpster and she she's putting captions about like sneaking in to swipe these wood pieces for our enclosures like it was like it was awesome that was in the uh, so back, I definitely wanted... that was in the back of the shop where my animals are and they cut down the yes. tree they cut down the tree in the parking lot and they threw all the branches in the dumpster i'm like what are you guys doing those are perfectly yeah. amazing branches why would you do that so i was dumpster diving for tree branches <laughs> I well, uh, and I, I just wanted so on Confessions podcast, we definitely talked about your professional life in, in therapy and, and work outside of reptiles quite a bit more than the lizard nerd uh, for this episode, which is why I wanted to have you for both because you have such a dichotomy there. Um, but on this particular, but in, in this avenue, I definitely wanted to make sure I also gave Sarah a shout out because she's constantly posting, like, oh. I got some scorpions from Bill and they're on my desk now while yeah. I do my work. Yeah, there's definitely uh, a two halves to WPS Reptiles. So I thought she's cool. the major social media half and I, I appreciate everything she does. So you guys are on TikTok too, aren't you? Is we are, but I TikTok? am. Yep. Yeah, uh, okay. I'm not nearly as prolific as you guys are. Uh, I've been trying to copy off Sarah. She's really good at social media. She's stuff. very good at and, it. Uh, yeah, dude, she she ran all the social media stuff for the reptile rescue at C2E2. Uh -huh. uh, she does a, she does a really good job. So that's, she that's does a awesome. lot of the Herb Society. If you you know when we do one of the things that we were doing through COVID, are are like Facebook Live interviews. So we you know we talked with Phil Goss, we talked with uh, the Amphibian Foundation, and um, Sarah does a lot of the promotion for that. So those really fancy posters and flyers on Facebook. That's all her. I mean, she's very creative and very talented and incredible at that social media piece so that's good because i don't want to do all that stuff so she could do that and it's <laughs> awesome and i'll i'll enjoy the benefits of it <laughs> well and, and that's the other thing for people um who are either watching the stream now or listening when this uh, episode comes out at a podcast if you are not in the midwest and or, or not in wisconsin you you don't have to physically in person participate in madison herb society dude they post all their stuff on facebook they yeah. facebook live their meetings uh you guys really broadcast all of that for people that especially you know during the pandemic and things it, it's become a lot more important um but even before that happened you, you guys were already doing that way ahead of the curve so um people can participate and especially yeah. i don't think i don't think as many people realize that it Herp societies sound very local and it it would seem like a small quote unquote concept. Um, but you guys get nationally and internationally important people to come talk to you. Yeah. You know, I mean, Ari and all these different people that show up, I mean, they're a really big deal. And they come hang out in Wisconsin and, and go it's eat cheese. Crazy. Um, it's crazy. And yeah. It's so for folks scattered around the country, you can interact with these people and, and see these things uh doing it live like we are through facebook and youtube i think that's awesome and i I'm, I'm so fortunate to be a part of this all i really I enjoy every moment of this reptile journey <laughs> all right man well we're gonna close it out so dude it was I awesome really chatting with you coming on. Bill. i hope you made it back uh, on again way easier too. For me to do this because i like i said i cheated and just picked one of my friends that i knew i'd be able to talk to for an hour and a half so no that's all good um, i know we could probably talk for hours it's great well that was the thing man. i want to be back on again sometime and i'll throw some other gecko lizard people at you absolutely we're gonna end up, we'll end up doing a gecko round table and talking for way too long it's all good that sounds great awesome man right, you man. have a good night Hi, bill it was you good too. to see you thanks for watching everybody <laughs> awesome take it easy man See ya. All right. So we were able to get Bill back. He was able to pitch all of his stuff probably in a better way than I could. Uh, for those of you who are listening to the podcast, check the show notes and I will put up the links that Billy was talking about for everybody who's in the live stream. I put up the Madison Herps, uh, dot org for you to check out. I strongly encourage you to do that. Um, check out your local herp societies. If you're able 
If you're not, they are a wonderful online resource. They really do have a serious diversity of subjects and speakers. Um, it, it's an awesome organization to be a part of. And Ryan started it. Billy's kind of taking the ball. Uh, and they're they're both just kicking that in a really great way. So I really appreciate everybody getting on live with us and talking to us. And we will see you in two weeks for another episode of Lizard Brain Radio.